Thank you everyone for coming and joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted to be running an in conversation with animation director Lorraine Lorden, which is presented by Screen Skills Animation Skills Fund and uh, Cardiff Animation Festival. And if you don't know, Screen Skills is the industry led skills body for the UK screen industries. Um, and I am Abigail, and I am the animation production liaison executive, and I manage the animation skills fund which has paid for this event and for other events, thanks to contributions from um, animation productions in the UK. So do keep an eye on screen skills for future animation events and training that's coming up. There'll be more coming over the next few weeks. Um, yeah, so yeah, keep an eye on our website, screenskills.com. So I'd really like to start this now with um, just handing over to Lauren, who is the director of Cardiff Animation Festival. And just to say that we're really proud that we are sponsoring Cardiff Animation Festival at this difficult time, but they've really risen to the challenge. So, Lauren, please uh, do tell a little bit more about what you're up to. Thanks so much, Abigail. Um, yeah, hi everybody, I'm Lauren from Cardiff Animation Festival, uh, which for those of you who don't know, was supposed to run the 2nd to the 5th of April uh, at Chapter in Cardiff. So uh, it's a weird time for festivals at the moment. Um, we were really excited to bring a ton of animation events to Cardiff and Lorraine's Masterclass was one of the ones who we were most excited to bring to Cardiff. So uh, we're really pleased uh, that we're as part of the screen to and that that hope we can bring this to you anyway. Um, Great, thank you Lauren, thanks for that. And now I'm really delighted, here is Lorraine all the way from Kilkenny. <laughs> Fly her over or anything. Here she is from the comfort of her own house. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, it's um, it's, a, it's nice to be able to finally do this event because you know it was really disappointing not to be able to do it in person. But uh, I think we're all adapting really well. So hopefully, uh, you know, everyone's getting uh, an opportunity that maybe some people might get an opportunity to see it that wouldn't have gotten to go to Cardiff. So there's a silver lining. Yes, but of course we encourage everyone to go to Cardiff when it's back because it is an amazing festival. It is. Yeah. Uh, but we are delighted that we are able to still make this event happen, as Lauren said. So this is really, you know, you work for Cartoon Saloon, who are one of the most brilliant, prestigious um, animation studios in the world, I would say. Um, but I think, you know, we, it's always good to recognise that some, everyone has to start somewhere. <laughs> so it'd be really good to sort of hear how you got to where you are. And I think let's, should we start at the very beginning about when you graduated, what was your first professional role and how did you go about finding it? Well, I'm probably in quite an unusual position because I, Cartoon Saloon was my first job, um, except Cartoon Saloon wasn't then what it is now. I went to college with, you know, a bunch of the people who started it and a bunch of people who actually still work there. So, um, you know, back then we were just college kids with like a big idea and um, had no idea that, you know, thankfully 20 years later, it's still going. Um, so probably I'm in quite an unusual position. I slightly fell into it, but I do believe that, you know, um, the, the friends that you make in college, you know, you'll know for, for your life. And especially in this industry that, um, that you'll know and support each other for a really long time. So I knew um, a lot of the people that worked there. I, I you know, Tom, Nora, um, Tom, Ross, um, and Jeremy, who I'm now assistant director to. So all these people I went to college with. And um, so the, we already kind of trusted each other. So when kind of a uh, position came up very, very soon after they started, they were just doing little, um, freelance jobs at the time and they needed a cleanup artist and um, although there were very great animators there were some people who worked really really rough and <laughs> they needed someone like me to come in and clean up the line afterwards so that's where I got started um, and more and more I fell into the special effects department and um, it was you know when I think back now that we used to hand all those effects with ink actually. <laughs> and uh, I would be too scared to do that now, you know, who works without an undo button, you know? <laughs> so, brilliant. so when, yeah. you, when you said you, you know, you sort of fell into special effects, was it, was it just that there was a job that came up in that role or did you sort of, sort of have an eye to it and think, oh, I'd be quite interested in trying that? 
Um, first of all, it was where the need was, um, and I was doing cleanup in special effects and in character, but it was more difficult to find cleanup artists for, um, for special effects. And a part of that that I really enjoyed was actually we used to um, go out and just, you know, do the effect and film it to see, you know, to do a lot of research. Um, and I used to really enjoy that part of it as well. So, you know, I remember throwing paint on a wall and filming it, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> And um, so that's kind of how I got more and more into that side of things. And, uh, and that's how I ended up in the end um, being a special effects artist on um, The Secret of Kells when that finally came about. And was that before you worked on that feature, did you, you spent some time working abroad on different, in different roles, is that right? Can yeah. you talk about how, what, what, made you, what made you leave Ireland and travel and, and how did those roles, how did you find those kind of roles? Well, at the time there wasn't a lot of work in Ireland actually there was um, you know there was and still is a lot of work in France uh, and at the time there was a really booming uh, hand-drawn animation in Germany so I assumed that I would probably have to go abroad most of my class would have assumed that they had to go abroad so it was a really ambitious plan for the for um, Tom Paul and Nord to have this idea to set up their own company there were very few at the time so it wasn't a big surprise to me when I eventually did you know there was there, there was no work in saloons um, and so I was you know looking around and at the time a lot of the job postings were on AWN and I saw this one in Prague and I thought this was really interesting. I knew very little about it, but um, I applied anyway. And the, the process was really interesting compared to what you might do. So, you know, in, in one way I had to do a test and you still have to do that, but because it was hand-drawn animation, I had to do my tests on paper. So, um, so I actually, you know, they email you the, um, the the images that they wanted you to, to to in between and give you crosses on it and then you line them up and you, you do your test. So I had a, a ream of paper about this thick for my test and I had to FedEx it to Prague and then they reviewed it and they emailed me the notes and then they sent me back the test to do the notes and I did the notes and I FedEx it back again and after that I got the job. So it was a really long process, you know, like now you're like, oh, okay, you do a test. Can you do it this weekend? You know, in a couple of weeks, but you know, there was a really, a really long back and forth between um, applying for a job then and actually getting it. But I was delighted to get it because it was so exciting, you know, to go to Prague at that time. What production was that you were working on? Uh, it was a show called Paz. Um, it started out being called Little Penguin and uh, it was based on books called Little Penguin. And um, uh, at some points they, they thought that, you know, all kids have nicknames and so Little Penguin became Paz. <laughs> and how did you find in that transition from working in a different country, like with the language and, you know, what did you need in terms of visas and all that kind of thing? Um, at the time uh, I was, you know, I, I kind of relied a lot on the studio for that side of things, you know, um, and they gave me a lot of advice and I followed it. And when I got there, they helped me set up a bank account and things like that. Um, so I was very much reliant on them for that. Um, and uh, the, the language of the studio was still English. So in that way, it was really useful. Um, it was probably a lot easier for me to make the transition than some others because of that. But we had animators from all over Western and Eastern Europe. So we did have to find that common ground. And, and for us, that was English. Um, another um, benefit was that it was for um, English producers. So they had um, an English animation, animation directors there. And so for me, I, it wasn't too difficult in the work setting to, um, to continue, you know, as normal. Um, but uh, I really admire people who are working in their second language. I see so many people in our studio as well, you know, who um, are communicating like really intricate ideas uh, and it's not their first language. So I really, really admire that. Um, so, but the outside of work, again, I was supported. I was, they helped me find, um, they helped me find somewhere to live and I was living with other animators. And so we were all kind of facing the same challenges and, 
uh, were able to support each other. But it was a really nice time for me, you know, because I was kind of young and out in the world. <laughs> And is that when you were working abroad, I remember you saying when we spoke before that you've been managing, you've been managing teams. Was that in Singapore? How did you sort of move around at this time and, and, and kind of progress as you were going? Actually, that, the going to Asia came a little bit later. Um, so I'd already been um, an animation supervisor at that point. And then um, it was on the same project that I became animation supervisor that I ended up going overseas to finish the project um, because the schedule became quite difficult. So we needed some support. So I went over to the team. We were working in a program called MOHO. Um, I went to Kuala Lumpur and um, Phnom Penh in Cambodia. So there was two different countries and I kind of zipped back and forth between the two of them just to get them kind of set up and going. Um, the main thing was to get them, get everybody on the same wavelength because when there's three studios involved and we're all trying to make you know episodes of the same program, it's really important that we're all, you know, moving in the same direction, um, have the same animation style. Um, so that was my main goal when I went there, was to, um, because we were sending over files to introduce them to our system so that they were understood and that that wasn't an impediment to them. And um, if I could help them in any way, you know, um, just to kind of get them into the style of the show. That was really, really important. So, um, you know, again, I got to work with really interesting people and with really unique worldviews. And um, the nice thing is like everybody who, who works in a project like this, you know, they bring something unique to it. So um, people were able to say, oh, let's try this. And that, things that I might never have thought of, but because of, the experience that they were bringing to the projects, they were bringing something unique. And uh, I think that every project is a culmination of that specific group of people in that setting. So, you know, you change one thing and, and something will change, you know. So I think it's, it's really amazing that, you know, every project is so unique to that group of people at that specific time in their career. So, because um, even now, I think if I if I went back and made something that I might have made even a year ago, it would be a different project than than what I have now. You know, so it's uh, I think it's a really interesting experience to travel abroad and meet many people and and try and um, try and learn from everyone. You know. And, and you can, so then you worked on the Secret of Kells. So that's. A feature film but you've also worked on tv series as well do you find that there is much difference working between those two different types of production yeah you have a preference i mean maybe i shouldn't say that because <laughs> you're obviously working on a feature right now yeah no but i'm working on a feature film that i've also worked on the tv series of so this is probably a very um specific and and very good frame of reference but i find that um I like the change of pace between film and TV. So in some ways I like to um, switch between them because by the time the series is very intense and it's go, 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 and it's like race to the finish line. Um, and I really enjoy that because you really pull together and um, uh, if everyone's pulling in the same direction, it's, it's a really amazing experience, but it's really stressful and it's really tough and you can get burnt out really easily if you're not careful and you can burn out your team if you're not really careful. So, but I like the buzz of that until I get to the end of it and I breathe and I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, so then uh, the difference for me with film is that it's a longer, slower process. Um, in some ways just as intense because there's a lot of pressure you know when you're making a film there's a lot of pressure to get seen by the right people and get the right quality and, and there's a lot of different things that kind of weigh on you that are you know you have way uh, weights on your mind on uh, with tv as well but they're different and um so i like the change of pace and i like to slow down and actually get that time to think about things more in depth and like oh do i want it this color do I want this character in this scene? Um, you know, where do I want this relationship to go? And and you get more time with the characters and uh, to to kind of develop that. Um, 
to, to make really considered choices, which you sometimes don't get that same time with, with TV series. But by the end of it, then I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go again. And I, and I want to get back to the series and, you know, get that, that kind of hit. <laughs> and with Secret of Curls, was that, that was obviously something that was in development for a long time. So you were, were you quite involved from the early on or did you sort of yeah. come into it and you came back? So when I joined, I was there um, from the end of, of 1999. And at that point, it was a, an idea and a story um, in people's heads. And there was a lot of work. But the idea was that this was the goal of the company was to make this film. And at that point, we were developing it. We were trying different uh, techniques and stuff like that. But we were also supporting that development by doing other jobs. Um, so after about a year and a half, um, they, I, I, um, I ended up leaving and going to Prague at that time because they were, they were, you know, in a, not in a position to keep me on. And um, so between that time when we had been doing all this work and the film used to be called Rebel uh, and it became The Secret of Kells, but it was always a book about a boy. It was always a film about a boy. Um, making this book um, so in some ways the essence of it always was there it just as the people who were who were developing it you know went along in their career and they were learning things and their sense of story changed you know it evolved over time and it was some years later that it actually went into production but the that small team that had been there at the beginning they really wanted that team to be involved again because they were so you know like to support something like that when it's not a big name studio and you know it's it it's, might sound strange but like uh Kurt and Saloon didn't mean then what it means today so it was like I just wanted to support my friends you know. Did you find then so the experience of working on Secret of Kells you then went on to be um, uh, in your career, you went on to be animation director on The Breadwinner, which is, you know, obviously has done a fantastically well as well for Cartoon Saloon. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you find, how did you find that navigating that experience from going from being an animator to having to direct other animators? Well, I had, uh, in between um, Secret of Kells, I had worked as um, the animation supervisors on um, Puff and Rock season two. So, I had that experience and I had done the overseas traveling by that stage. Um, so it kind of felt like a natural step. And it was actually a really comfortable move for me because I knew so many people at Cartoon Saloon. Um, the team that I was going to be working with in On the Breadwinner was people that I had worked with before. So it was a really nice kind of reconnection with people for me. But I should say that there was um, you know, uh, if you've seen the bed one, you've seen that there's two separate parts to the film. There's, um, there's the real world and there's the story world. And so we had two animation directors on that film and, uh, Fabian Erlinghauser was, um, you know, really looked after the, the real world and I looked after the, the story world. Um, so in some ways I think I got the better end of the stick because the story world is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was lovely to come back to a team that I knew well and, um, you know, because one of the things about coming into a new project is, you know, getting to know everyone, getting to know their style, getting to figure out how to work with them. Um, and I think that was one of the things that I learned as I became a supervisor is that, you know, you have to, you have to figure out how people work because you know, it's, you can't say the same thing to two people and have them react the same way. Um, and a lot of times you're, you're saying to someone, oh, can you do it this way instead? And with the best will in the world, someone might get upset by that. But, you, but what is important for me to make clear is that there's nothing wrong in animation. There's no wrong way to do something. So what's important is it's, this isn't wrong. It's just not what I had in my head, you know? And the other thing is that sometimes I might have some information that maybe you don't, you know, that sometimes you might be giving away a joke in your scene by doing something that I was saving for another scene. And it's just, um, it's about communicating that really clearly that 
animation is so personal that every way is the right way. It's just not the way that you might have chosen to do something. So it's important to be mindful of people when you're kind of doing that because we're all artists and we're all sensitive. Um, and the way of communicating with people, I, that's what I learned, is not the same for everyone. So for one person, you have to give a bit of tough love and with someone else, you have to be like, I really love this. It's just not right for this scene. So um, that's the, the main thing that I learned when I first started supervising. It's really, I mean, that's really interesting to hear. I mean, it is so much about individual personality and, you know, who, who you have in a team with animation. So from your perspective, then, what do you look for when you're, you're looking to crew up? What kind of, you know, what qualities are you looking for? What do you want to see when you're, you're, you're starting to say set up for something like the breadwinner or Puffin Rock, you know, what are you looking for? Well, I suppose, I mean, we're looking at the skill set, obviously, but that's not what makes a team in a way. There are so many talented people in the world that, you know, we could easily fill many, many teams. So like, how do you make a team is the question. And I think it's trying to find people with complementary talents. So if you have someone who's really strong in one area, but maybe has slight weakness in the other one, but they'd love to develop it and, you know, you can kind of see potential there, then you're going to want to balance that out with someone who's stronger in that area. And maybe they can help each other grow as, as animators. And so I think it's really important to balance team. Um, I think you have to have, you know, see different levels. I think you have to have seniors and juniors because um, so that they can all help each other and that uh, you can, if you're in a team and, you know, sometimes your supervisor is not always available, that there are people there that you can go to for help. Um, and I think the other thing that's really important for me is that I can see that they're good communicators. You know, you don't have to be like very talkative. That's not the same thing, but that you can be very um, clear about what you what you need from, from me and what I can give to you and that we can talk about the scene and discuss it. And at the end that, you know, we'll both end up with something that we're both happy. And, you know, that's not always the easiest. And, that might be something in a TV series that you're something like, okay, this is something we can live with as opposed to something I'm happy with. Um, whereas you get, you, you get those extra goals on a feature film. Mm, that's, that's, yeah, that's really interesting to hear it from your perspective because yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are listening into this call who are animators. So it's, um, I think it's quite useful to hear what you're looking for, the people yeah. who are looking to get into, into the kind of work that you do. Yeah. And also, I noticed that you you have your own company as well, don't you? So I'm not how how do you, how do you have enough time in the day <laughs> to be making feature films and doing your own work? <laughs> well, I don't really is the answer. Um, I I do have a company, but it's in really I just um, do small projects on the side with it um, at the moment. So I took some time out for from Cartoon Saloon for the last year, and I made a short film. So, and we just finished that at the end of 2019. So that's hopefully going to, uh, to travel to some festivals whenever that comes about again. But, um, uh, so that I ran that personal project through uh, Man and Ink. Uh, it was very much supported by Cartoon Saloon. And, you know, I, I went to them and said, I wanted to do this um, to kind of develop my own skills um, as a director. And, um, it was, you know, a little, uh, a good stepping stone for me so that I'm not jumping into a massive project without having explored all that kind of areas. So that was a really good opportunity for me. And um, I, I got the funding for it and I wrote the script and I worked with a designer while I was still working. But once we went into full production, I was solely dedicated to that. And then towards the end again, I was able to go back to work and I was able to start working on Puff and Rock, but there was still post-production going on. There was still some compositing going on and I was doing reviews and things like that. Um, I was also working on music and sound design, but they were maybe a day out of my week. Um, so you, 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 you did a cat called Jam, the short film, mm. cartoon saloon, and you thinking that this would be useful in your role on Puffin Rock? Was this kind of part of the, the, the strategy you had in mind? Um, I think 
you know, I'm, it was a story that I'd wanted to tell for a long time. You know, I think we all have stories in the back of our heads. So we think, oh, Sunday, we're going to make that. And that's what a uh, cat called jam was for me was that story in the back of my head. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't a writer and I definitely didn't consider myself one. Um, so when I went to try and get this idea out of my head, I had to go away and go, okay, what do I need to make this? And so I did um, screenwriting evening classes and then I did a three day workshop. Um, and then I did um, a workshop that we go through, I think it was like eight or 10 weeks and we meet once a week with other writers. And we, we show them the pages that we've worked on that week. And I had to do this to get to a place where I could tell my story and where I had the confidence to tell in my story as well. So, um, cause I feel like I have a lot of ideas, but it's very difficult to get an idea like from your head to the page and communicate it to other people. So that was something that I had to develop in myself. And I did do that over a couple of years. It wasn't like, oh, I've done one class and now I know how to write, you know? So I, I and I didn't, I didn't stop at just one. And because, you know, um, I'm a big believer in that in, you learn different things from different people and the more people you work with and the more people you can learn from. So by doing these three different classes, I got three different insights into how to do the same thing. And it helped me find my way to do it, you know? So it mightn't have been quite the, the way of the first guy, but it, the, the third guy gave me, was really good at like bouncing ideas off um, because he was a more, more creative workshop as opposed to, you know, this is the structure that you need. Um, because some, in some ways, um, the structure is the easy bit. Um, but like having coherence and a thread that carries through your whole film or your whole story was the part that, uh, that I kind of was lacking in confidence in. So it really helped me to get these three different perspectives. I mean, I've seen the film, so I know it is brilliant. <laughs> so I really hope it will be out there soon and other people can get to see it. Oh, yeah. I think that's a really, I think it is, if you have ambitions to be a feature director, it does make sense to go through that process with a short film. And so, as you said, like really be able to hone your craft and understand, you know, to be able to improve your skill set, like you're saying, like you're recognising something in yourself and then being able to go out and do the training is really brilliant. Yeah, and, and even now I still watch loads of webinars, you know, from other people and I love to see other people do it because, you know, Sometimes, even if I'm working with an animator and, uh, and they, they give me a scene, I'm like, oh, that's weird. I would never have thought of that. And, and then, you know, I'm like, oh, do you know what we could do now? Let's push that for, further and like, so you can roll with it. So um, it's, sometimes it's really difficult to be open to ideas, but it's important to give it the thought. Because sometimes you go, oh, that's a cool idea. That would be great. But, oh, it doesn't work with this bit. Um, but, uh, sometimes it can be like, oh no, this is what I want. This is the only thing I want. And you have to kind of give your minute to give yourself a minute to go, wait, is it just because this is how I've seen it? Is this actually better? And that's a really hard question to ask yourself. Um, but if you give yourself time and you say, actually, no, I still want this idea. It's still right for my film. Then at least you're not dismissing something out of hand and you're saying, I appreciate the thought that you've given this, but for me, this is the one that still works. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard to give your, to make yourself step back from it and go, okay, give this a minute. Yeah. It's about, it's a confidence, isn't it? To have confidence in yourself. If you question something, like you say, when you've already seen a script and a storyboard and you're in a process. Yeah. Could you, just to give people a bit of, um, I suppose a kind of overview of the feature film you're working on and, and what that kind of entails. Um, could you <laughs> could you sort of roughly say, you know, where you are in the production and, and how many other people are around you? You know, how many animators are you working with? Who are you working with in different studios? If you're allowed, if that's okay. Well, I can say that we're in the very early stages. So we're we're very much working on the development of the film and the story. But at the same time, there's a lot of known quantities because we're working on something that's based on a TV series. So we know our characters. We know what they would and wouldn't do in situations. So what we're working on really is the situations. You know what I mean? Um, 
the, the characters they can they can evolve but they are who they are so it would be shocking to an audience who would know them if we suddenly made you know the characters completely different personalities so we have to be true to the tv series and to the people who already watch it and know it and love it um, but we also have to bring along you know the kids who have never seen um, Puff and Rock on Netflix and might be seeing it for the first time so we have to strike that balance and that's kind of where we're at is developing that story we're working in storyboard um, because the film is bigger we're extending the world a little bit so we're working on the location and the world building um, and uh, we're also developing music and things like that so we're developing a sound of the film that might like the the sound of the of the TV series is lovely and we were lucky that there's an orchestra on it, but we get to, you know, maybe take a little bit risks because we've got a longer time um, and give characters a unique theme or something like that. So we're exploring a lot of things right now, which is lovely um, because once you get into production, sometimes you're racing to the finish line. So in terms of that process then, I mean, when you say the finish line, what year are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> um, at the beginning of the year I would have been able to tell you next year now I couldn't tell you <laughs> but we are continuing to work you know we're adapting to the situation work is ongoing but you know we don't know what the future holds I, mean, I haven't looked through the chat but I imagine one of the questions that will be coming up is how do people get to work at Cartoon Saloon how do people get to be you uh, <laughs> would you be able to give any guidance on that I know, I guess you guys can't go to college with them. <laughs> no, though it is good to point out that it is a small industry, so it's good to be friends with everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think that's something that you will be surprised by is that, you know, the person you meet on your first job could be the person you meet again on your fifth job. You know, it's, you meet people again and again. It's so important to, um, you know, respect everyone that you work with and, you know, do your best to, to get along. Um, I know that, you know, everybody's not going to be best friends with everyone, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is that you trust each other and you can communicate well, and that you respect that we're all trying to go in the same direction. And that is get the best project that you can get. And if someone's disagreeing with you and um, you don't like what they're saying, you still, if you can behind all that say, okay, the reason that they think this is because they think this is the best thing for the project, then you can, you know, you can, you can maybe see where they're coming from in a, a little bit easier, but it's difficult, you know, because there's so many creative people together and people have so many ideas and you can't get every idea into every film. You can't get every idea into every um, TV series. And I know even myself, there's ideas that I had to throw out of my film that I was so upset to throw out but otherwise I'd have had a 20 minute film, but it would also have been boring. No one wants to watch 20, 20 minutes of it, you know? I just loved this one particular scene, but it really didn't advance the story and it would have just taken you out of where, of where the rest of it was going. So as much as it was difficult for me to do that, uh, I, I caught it, but really, really sadly. <laughs> You, have you got a trailer for Capital Jam or a trailer for Cartoon Saloon you want to play before we do some questions? Yeah. Okay, I have a trailer of, um, from Cartoon Saloon and it's, um, it's got a little bit of a mix of everything. So um, it's quite up to date. So even the most recent TV series are on. So I hope you enjoy it.
sounds amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Lorraine. Or do you want to quickly play a cat called Jam? Have you ever thought you were meant to be something different? Not a cat. Keep your eyes peeled, everyone, for that in the future. Okay, now I'm going to quiz you with the, the questions from the audience. <laughs> um, okay, so one question that came in is, um, you know, if you are starting out, you're a complete novice and you want to get into the industry, um, how do you kind of make those contacts? How do you get to network and to, you know, get your portfolio together? What would you recommend to someone who's sort of just just kind of you know leaving school and, and what's the next steps for them yeah it's a really difficult stage um some people love them some people hate them but actually internships can be really useful um because you're in the building and people get to see what you can do and you get to prove yourself um and you know when something does come up then People are like, oh, there was that lovely person. They were so talented. They were so nice to have around. It would be lovely to give them a chance. So I know that people have mixed feelings about that, but that is that has definitely been a way that we have met some really talented artists and that we have been able to hire them because we know that we can work well together. We know that they understand our style. So that's that's a really good way to, to do things. Um, but the other thing, I suppose, is just to um, keep an eye on opportunities to meet people, which is, you know, festivals are really, really great. Um, there'll be there's different events that, you know, um, that you guys run. And when you have speakers coming, you know, normally they are very um, open to meeting people afterwards. So those are really useful because you kind of get a two for one situation where you get to see the person. And if you're lucky, you might get some, um, get some time afterwards as well. But like people are very generous with their time. Um, so that's another way to, to meet people. But I think um, it's, it's difficult. So you do have to be patient. And I know that, um, I've spoken to people and they said that the, you know, sometimes it can be really disheartening. And um, what I would just say is hang in there. That sometimes it's really not personal. It's just that sometimes um, when, when we put out for a job or something like that, we just get a very overwhelming response. And um, I would just say, keep trying, you know, if that happens, I know it's really difficult. Um, I have joked that when the rejections come my way, I like to wallow <laughs> and, and it's okay to feel a little bit sorry for yourself because it's disappointing and we're all human. But the main thing is to, you know, not let it keep you down and to pick yourself up again and, and try again. Um, and I would definitely say, you know, if I know that I've been on, on the receiving end of like, here are your applications for this position. And there are so many talented people and we don't have as many positions. So it doesn't mean that you're not a talented person. It just means you're not the person for this role. Um, and just keep looking for the role that's the right fit for you is what I would say to that. One question I've got here is about mentors. Have you had any mentors, um, especially when you've been moving from one area to another, like with writing and directing, other than training you've gone on, but have there been any people that you've, you know, had, those kind of uh, more informal mentorships with? Um, I think for me, I've kind of had the experience of growing together. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I'll figure something out and say, oh, did you know this, this is how this works? And somebody else goes, no, but did you know? <laughs> so um, I've had that experience of like growing together with, um, with many of the people that I work with, which, which is really, really nice. Um, but I, I did have people that I looked up to. I think like absolutely everybody looked up to Richard Williams, you know, everyone owns the book. Um, and, you know, Jean Deitch passed away lately. And 
I never met him, but I do remember when I was moving to Prague, going, there's this guy in Prague. <laughs> and I knew he already lived there and I knew he was an amazing animator. And, and I was, you know, he was quite inspirational to me that he had already made that move. So for me, there was a lot of people who were very inspirational um, that I looked up to like that in that kind of a way. Um, but I think the other thing that was interesting is at that stage for me, we didn't have the access to information that we have now and to people because now you can go online and you can sign up for the webinar or you can follow them on Facebook or Twitter and you know and they're sharing this amazing you know they do a doodle or they say oh we did this thing in work today and I learned this and they talk about color theory and all these things that I didn't learn until much much later uh, and I still like every day on my lunch I look at tutorials about color theory and about story and about casting and about music theory um, and so i think that you will always be learning and the mentors will come in many many forms you know um, but you can search the the options available to you now to search for them are endless so and i encourage you to do that so some specifically cartoon saloon questions. Um, how long do you spend on story, storyboarding, animatic stages for cartoon saloon? A pre-production question for you there. <laughs> maybe just like maybe the general timeline for your features. Seeing as you guys are very good at churning them out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the first one took 10 years, so. <laughs> getting better, aren't you? Getting... <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting better. Um, but I think that's that's a factor as well is the fact that um, you know each of the directors are getting more experienced and uh, I think um, the gestation time is a big um, factor in how quickly things are if you have a very clear idea and I, I think it I think it differs there's no two projects the same so it's quite a difficult thing to say um, you know we we have uh, three storyboarders working with us now and we had planned for this period of time but um, now that things have the the schedule has evolved because of the coronavirus we have this opportunity to um refine the story a bit more so we're taking advantage of it we're keeping them a bit longer and we're we're um looking at the things in more depth that we might have had to rush through the first time go oh let's have another look at this now we've got some time uh, and hopefully at the end you'll see all the benefit of that but it's not very helpful to say it's different for every project but it's true it's based on schedule and budget and the number of people that you have and they're they're all factors that affect you know how long you every department runs for you know Thank you. Um, and what would do you have an in-house development team is a question we've got here um we do have um we do have a development executive and uh she um works with people then depending on the project on the needs of the project so um there wouldn't be a person full-time working on it but then she would say oh right now i need um someone to work on characters design and then she would be able to pull from a pool of people who are character designers and you know again you match the project to the person because you want someone that's this is going to suit their style and they're going to love working on this. If you pick someone who this style doesn't come naturally to, then they're going to struggle and they're not going to enjoy it and they're not going to do good work. So um, we do have a development executive and um, she does draw on the pool of artists that we have in the studio, depending on the needs of the project. So, um, cause they can be at different stages. You know, you have character design, you have location design, you have story. Um, uh and if you're doing a trailer you have um you have storyboarding so um there's not a full-time development team that works on that but there is development ongoing all the time in the studio and then sort of following on you, you mentioned about storyboarders um someone asks what's the core skills that you look for for a story artist um yeah it's i think it's uh Again, every project is unique. Um, for Puff and Rock, we have a set visual style. So there's a set camera language. So um, 
we would be looking for them to understand, to be able to interpret that from the TV series and, um, you know, evolve. We're, we're trying to make it a little bit, the world a little bit bigger in, in the film. So, but we would want to make sure that we're being true to our base and that, you know, we're not changing the, the cutting pacing, we're not changing the camera angles too much, that it's still the look that we're familiar with. So I think um, understanding camera language is important, understanding um, uh, pacing is important, but I think at the end of the day, all of those things are things that can be refined um, as long as you understand the storytelling and what is the main aim of the scene, like what do we need to communicate? So I think in a lot of things, again, it all comes back to communication. Great stuff. And then I'm going to, this one I probably should have asked myself at the very beginning, but what inspired you to become an animator? Are there particular animators or animated films that inspired you? Um, I have a funny story about how I discovered animation, actually. And um, I, all I wanted to do, when I was young, I used to... Um, just draw all the time and read books. And um, ever so often I would make up little plays and put them on for my parents. But I didn't make any connection with animation. I used to go to the cinema, but I didn't understand what I was looking at. I didn't understand that I was watching drawings move. So when I came to secondary school and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, to me it was just, it was either going to be something to do with writing or art. Uh, and I was leaning towards art and I, you know, got my portfolio ready for, for art college. And to do that, I did a, a one year portfolio course, which is, you know, loads of loads of places do. But I did mine in Cork, where I'm from. And it was there that I met Nora Toomey. And Nora, I thought he was like, you know, what are you going to do? I was like, oh, I don't know. I'm going to probably do fine art. And I was like, what are you going to do? And she's like, oh, I'm going to do animation. I'm like, animation? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> So she's like, oh, there's a school in, in Dublin. It's called Valley Fermit. We're all going to go there and told me all about it. And my mind was blown. And um, because in a weird way uh, that I hadn't previously understood that that was what I had been looking for. Um, when I was younger, I would get, you know, buy books with Disney pictures and then I would like copy them religiously. And um, I would like watch a lot of animated movies and stuff like that. But because I didn't understand that there were drawings, I didn't make that any kind of connection to what I was doing. So like she opened up a whole world for me. And, um, but it, then it just, it just felt natural. I felt like that's where I should have been all along. I just didn't know it. Um, especially when it came to the fact that I already loved reading and telling stories and that I kind of had been, I had looked at Disney films when, oh, they're, tell, they're retelling um, fairy tales. So I would pick a fairy tale that they hadn't done and I would make my own story and I would put this on for my parents with the like, puppets and stuff. So um, I think for me, I just didn't know it, but everything was leading that direction. Yeah, exactly. It's the drawing and the storytelling. You, <laughs> that's so amazing, just an offhand conversation about <laughs> <laughs> what Nora was going to do. Yeah. Change the course of history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I immediately, immediately took a right turn and, and I didn't even apply for art colleges. I just applied for animation college after that. And, um, but I have to say, even then Nora was very um, inspiring to me because she was a little bit older and she knew exactly what she wanted to do. And for me as a 17 year old who had no clue what to do, um, I was so impressed. <laughs> And what would be your, your advice then to a 17 year old now who wants to go and do animation? Because they know all about it these days, 17 year olds. <laughs> how, how, do they, how do they make it happen? <laughs> uh, well, I, I just think that, that, um, that drawing and painting, and I think the other thing that probably, um, for me, I, I like the drawing part, which is why cleanup came quite easy to me and, and the being um, an animator was. But I know that other people can find their way in through, you know, painting backgrounds or um, location design or character design. And maybe it's not, you know, maybe they don't want to be an animator, but there's so many ways to support a film or a short or a series. Like there's so many people needed to, to make up that whole. Um, and I think it's just really important to appreciate because sometimes I think um, 
and we just get all the glory. <laughs> but there's such a huge team behind it, you know, and the production team, the coordinators, the project managers, you know, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't even know where I was supposed to be at any given time of the day. It's very good. It's a good point. It's all about the team. Um, and then finally, I was just going to ask um, if you wanted to give any updates of what's going on with Cartoon Saloon. You know, we're all in a strange time right now. Obviously, as you said, Puffin Rock, you're working away on the development of it. What else is happening? Are there things you can tell us about? Um, well, I can tell you that the films are still all going on. Um, you know, My Father's Dragon is, is um, kind of at the same stage that we are. They're working on storyboard and story and... Um, the uh, Wolf Walkers is coming towards the end. Um, so they have been working on compositing. Um, when it's going to be released, I don't know now, but they, you know, they've been working on music and um, they're kind of at the final stages. So it is nearly finished. Luckily enough, um, they, they were able to finish out the production and uh, it's, you know, practically ready to go. But when it's going to go is is another question. But um, yeah, we're 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 working away. We're adapting to the situation. Basically, you know, things are still ongoing, and uh, you know, I'm really thankful that we're in animation. We are actually managing to keep going, and I, in some cases, thriving. You know, because people are turning to animation. So hopefully, it'll be. Um, really good opportunity for the industry to showcase just how many talented people that we have absolutely what a great positive note to end on thank you lorraine thank you so much for spending this hour with us and uh, thank you everyone for attending and i hope you enjoyed lorraine's talk thank you thank you so much